Hello, everyone. We are happy to welcome you to this webinar. This webinar is actually the English version of a webinar that has already been shared by our French colleagues. As the title says, it will be about the seven data and AI trends for 2022, so called the seven hot topics for 2022. So like in the French webinar, we will be discussing the latest technology trends that will really drive the business, that will drive the creation of value through data and AI in the coming year. However, in this session, we will tackle only five topics out of the seven with the help of our experts who will be joining me today. If you would like to hear more information about those two other topics that we will not cover, please refer either to the French version of this webinar or turn to our LinkedIn channel where we will be sharing more information about each of these topics very soon. So let me introduce myself. My name is Florian and I will be hosting this webinar today. I'm part of Business and Decision. I have been working here for the past two years. And for those of you who do not know Business and Decision, well, let me say a few words about it. So we are a consulting and services company specialized in data valorization. We have been active for 30 years, and actually this year marks our 30th birthday. We have more than 2,000 experts over several geographies. We are actually very present in France, but also in Europe and in some countries in North Africa. We offer a very large scope of skills and services around data and AI in all sectors. And our main goal always remains to create value from your bulk of data through AI. Now back to our webinar. This is the sixth time that we go through this exercise of defining hot topics for the coming year. But it's the first time that we are translating it in English and giving it available for all our audience who speaks English. So if you would like to see our previous sessions who are only in French, unfortunately, well, you can still see them in our website or our LinkedIn pages. This time we have gathered more than 40 experts to do a brainstorming, to exchange their ideas and to vote on the list of topics that they considered were crucial for this year. And before we go into details into each topic, let's reflect on the results of a recent study that was published by Gartner at the end of last year that states that the two topics of data and AI were more than ever on the agenda of decision makers. So when they were asked in the context of COVID, what their priorities would be, well, key stakeholders put digital initiatives as a number one priority way ahead of the rest, and especially in the areas of analytics and artificial intelligence. It is actually the first year that decision makers are putting digital as a priority for the development of their company in the years to come. That means that everyone is now recognizing how important and valuable AI is, and it becomes a strategic topic for all companies regardless of their industry, sector, or size. All right, so generally speaking, there will be three main pillars, three key challenges that will drive trends in 2022. And we will see that all topics from our list actually relate to one or the other in a way. Our first one is data and AI platforms. So for a very long time, we have known and used data warehouses, where we would focus on centralization of data. However, this came with flaws that we all know, like for example, the lack of agility. That is why we are now facing an actual revolution in terms of data and AI platforms, which is being boosted by new cloud technologies, but also by the virtualization of data. Now, this will bring some challenges, of course, but for sure we are, in a, we are moving towards a renewal of data and AI platforms as we know them today. Then we have the industrialization of data projects and with it, the industrialization of AI algorithms. So they can really be at the heart of company processes. Here again, for years, we have been using mock-ups, proofs of concept, proofs of values, etc. But now it's time to scale up, to generalize algorithms, to create value directly in the business processes. Our third main challenge will be to have a responsible AI, because we will actually keep creating val value. We will keep coming up with new algorithms for new use cases. However, this has to be sustainable. And it will be if the AI is ethical, responsible, and green. All right, so we will now move on to the list of topics that interest us. You may have already seen them on our LinkedIn page as we have been sharing short introduction videos on each of them all through January. And now we will be showing you all of those intro videos combined together into a main one. And then we will meet right after.
All right, so as I was saying before, we will now tackle only five topics out of these seven. And the order will be a bit different as well. We will start with IoT and AI Smart X, then the industrialization of AI, the data mesh, green AI, and enterprise platform. We will not cover the FinOps and trust and sovereignty topics. So for this first topic, I would like to welcome our expert, Thomas, who has been working in business and decision for four years as a data science consultant. All right, so Thomas, can you give us your thoughts on this first topic? Yeah, so we've been hearing a lot about uh, IoT and AI in the recent years, uh, but it's getting more and more traction uh, these days. All right, why do you think that is? Well, I see mainly two reasons. Uh, the first one would be that previously we've always had uh, a lot of data that was coming from personal data. But a recent study from the IDC predicts that by 2025, so in three years from now, that nearly 50% of the data that is generated will be coming from IoT connected devices, um, industrial data. And so with all this data coming in, um, there will be also a lot of new use cases that uh, can be done. Things like uh, predictive maintenance on industrial machines, uh, but it could also be on personal cars. You could monitor fleets, boats, uh, traffic, uh, all those kind of stuff. You can use it to lower energy costs. Um, and with all this, there are new business models that come in. And that's where the smart X comes from. So you have smart cities, uh, smart governments, smart industries. So that's for the, the first factor. The second factor is that due to this uh, huge amount of data that is coming in, we need also to have other ways to, or better, more optimized ways to store the data, to visualize it, to process it. And that's where the cloud data platforms come in, which has have also been developed a lot uh, these uh, recent years. Uh, together with, if you combine it then with edge computing, 5G technologies uh, and AI, there are even more possibilities. All right, so have you already worked on such projects? Do you have use cases you would like to share? So yeah, at Business and Decision, we've been working on some use cases. We've been working on uh, the architecture design of data platforms for the Flemish government. We've also been working on uh, yeah, similar platforms for the port of Antwerp. Then we've also had a use case for real-time uh, tracking of uh, the industrial machines for, uh, yeah, for industrial manufacturer. And finally, we've been also working with the city of Ghent, where we uh, traffic, traffic conditions and uh, parking spaces. And so with all these new use cases, there is a lot of things that will change. Um, but there are also new challenges that will come things like uh, security concerns, uh, but those are also things uh, that we can help on. All right, thank you very much. No. Now on to our second topic, still with our data science expert, we will be talking about the industrialization of AI. Can you please give us more details on this? Yeah, so um, in AI, you have two big streams. You have uh, on the one hand, supervised uh, machine learning algorithms and unsupervised. So as the name says it, for supervised, you're basically kind of telling what the machine should learn or should try to, to perform. Um, the unsupervised is where you don't have, as we call it, data that is labeled. And you're kind of trying to make the machine find itself um, patterns, uh, topics, those kind of things. So obviously, the second one is more complicated than the first one. And in the industry, uh, in general, it's also more focused on the supervised uh, machine learning part. And so obviously, for this, um, we need data. We need data that is uh, labeled. And to get these labels, it requires a lot of time. It also requires uh, business knowledge, domain knowledge, because of course, you need to label the data correctly so that uh, the machine can understand correctly, let's say, what uh, you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to predict. 
Um, but luckily for us, there are uh, AI power tools that can help us with this uh, data labeling phase. And so this data labeling phase is part of a bigger global process that we uh, call MLOps. Right, and MLOps stands for? So MLOps is a concatenation of ML, which comes from machine learning, and ops from operations. So it's kind of putting machine learning models uh, into production, but it's broader than that. It covers actually the, the whole process of conception uh, of the model into a final uh, part of putting it into production. So for instance, uh, we have had a, a case in uh, computer vision for a, pharmace a pharmaceutical company where we needed to um, basically automate one of their quality checks. Uh, there were growing uh, bacteria on Petri plates and they needed to check if the bacteria did or did not grow. So what we did is that we took pictures of those uh, Petri plates and we used that as a input to our algorithm. But of course, those data needs to be labeled. So um, someone needed to say per image if it was a good or a bad example. So there as well, uh, we needed to work together with the client, also with our uh, life science department to really understand the problem correctly and assign the right labels. And so one of the um, parts of the project was also giving recommendations on how to put this uh, project into production. So let's imagine that uh, it runs into production and at some point there needs to be uh, maintenance of the camera that is taking the pictures. Well, you still need to make sure that after this maintenance the model still works correctly, right? Um, it's going to be an automatic process, so you need to make sure that everything runs fine as well. Uh, and that's where AI monitoring comes in. So AI monitoring has typically two sides. You have um, data drift and model drift. So data drift is typically the example that I gave. The camera um, has some maintenance and the images are slightly different, which means that the data itself is different. Uh, and so you need to make sure that the model still works with this different data. Model drift would be, for instance, uh, let's say that you're predicting the performance of a certain promotion, let's say on uh, toilet paper, uh, everything works fine. Uh, and then COVID comes in, the confinement comes in, everything, everyone gets crazy about toilet paper. The concept of buying toilet paper has completely changed. And so um, the model, of course, probably won't work as well as before. So those are two things uh, that you need to monitor as well and uh, to make sure that everything keeps running smoothly, uh, even if your model is in production, the story doesn't end there. All right. Well, thank you very much for your insights. No problem. With pleasure. All right. So for our next topic, Data Mesh, we welcome our new expert, Yasser, who has recently joined Business and Decision. He will be working as a tried lead in data strategy and data governance. Hello, Yasser. Hi, Florent. Nice All to meet right. you. Nice to meet you too. Um, so data mesh is a buzzword. We hear it everywhere. But what does it mean? So could you tell us in one sentence what it is? Uh, one sentence, it's difficult, but I will try. F for me, the data mesh is uh, a new way of organizing the data uh, and information of large organizations by serving consumer communities in a decentralized architecture around data uh, products clusters. All right, thank you. Well, if you would like to get more into detail. Yeah, I mean, by, 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 by identifying the communities, the data products, as well, the, the decentralized architecture, we have pointed already three topics. We're speaking about the organization, we're speaking about the architecture, and we are also speaking about the the, the product, data product owners, and so on, which mainly a kind of, of, of processing 
processes within the organization. So the new data mesh, the data mesh, sorry, is, a, is, is shaping a new way of, of, of data governance around those three topics, the organizations, the, the, the process, and the architecture part. All right, and why would it be so important to switch to a data yeah, mesh? That's, that's also an interesting question. In my opinion, uh, large organizations, early adapters started, have, the, have, have identified that data in the organization is very important to them and they have to, to organize it to serve internally and also their end client with the data to be data driven. So it comes that we need to group all the data in one central point to put a data gov layer on the top of it in order to make it available for the consumer, either internal ones or external ones. By internal, I mean uh, the, their own uh, the, their own departments or, or, or actually, uh, how, how can I say, consumers and also for their end clients to be customer centric. Doing this, they, they, they managed to get it, but after now, I would say a few years with, with this new, this organization, some issues start popping up. Uh, among the issues, for instance, that data is very needed, so there are a lot of consumer coming on, and sometimes the data integration become really a bottleneck because everything is siloed. To, to add the new data, what did happen with this centralized organization, they put teams to, uh, to do the integration part. And uh, all the community now is depending of this integration process and it's leading to some latency and so on. That's one element. Second element also, some organizations are global, so they are everywhere, some in the European region, in the North America, in Asia. So data are spread over the, all over the world. And their end clients as well are global as well. So they are also distributed. So having some limitation on the, some regulatory impact, for instance, with the GDPR, we cannot share the European data, move it to, to, the, to the, how can I say, to the North America region for a corporation because we have a legal, a legal, uh, legal how can I say, um, regulation. Banks as well, they have also, they cannot share the, 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 the transactions Global banks, they cannot share the, the global region. So we've seen here that not only the way of organizing the data, but also some regulations start pushing those global and large organizations to think differently in order to, to be able to serve their end clients. All right. Do you have a concrete example of this? I mean, I can give in, for in the pharmaceutical area, I think it's, it's something that could be interesting. Let, let's take, for instance, an example of a big pharma, uh, a, a big, big player with the pharma organizations. They do, for instance, some, some analysis and so on. We know that the pharma is well organized. They have also the, the validation process and so on. So if now with the pharma, there are a lot of acquisitions. So you have different teams working in different regions, doing different analysis, specific analysis, for instance. And they are working with global pharmaceutical companies, like uh, you can give uh, among of them, you have Pfizer, you have Roche, you have uh, uh, different ones. They are all also globally uh, presented. And the data there are also distributed. So it doesn't make any sense as a company serving those big pharma organizations to group all their data in one central point, bringing them from different region with different limitation and then distributing them to the thing. So the purpose is that why you not just organize community around a specific data product pattern or cluster, regionally decentralized, with a good governance on it, and serve it to the client. So my client, for instance, Pfizer, can access the, the community of the US, can access the data in the US. The community, for instance, in, the, in, in Europe can access the data there, and we have the governance around it. That's something that I can give. Sorry, it's a, it's kind of a hypothetic example, but just uh, one of the examples that can, can be can, can help to understand this. All right, thank you. And how do you think business and decision could help the customers in achieving this? Yeah, I mean, business and decision have a large footprint actually on, on, on the data area for a long time. So we have been uh, helping our end client already from the phase one of the, the data cloudification, the data transformation. So we, 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 we went through them with, through this journey 
and we did help them, not only from the strategic point of view, but as well from the implementation. And now we've seen also the limitation of those big organizations, how they struggle with this kind of, of architecture that is not decentralized and so on. So I think business and decision have the capability and also the, the, the skills and the asset to, to support and to help those companies to, to move on by, by how, I would say. In, first of all, by putting, uh, helping them with, with organizing the framework around how we can govern data decentralized. We also have a good technical people who can really help them how we can have a decentralized cloud uh, or, uh, architecture. And also from the integration point of view, we have a good integrate, integration experience. Then we can also address the, the integration of the data, like event management or whatever, in the decentralized mode. So I think business and decision can, can, can help on that purpose. All right. Thank you very much, Yasser, for your very interesting insights on this topic. And now we will move on to our next topic, Green AI. All right. So to introduce our next topic, Green AI, we welcome our next expert, Felix. Felix has joined Business and Decision last year in our office in Utrecht, and he works as a data engineer consultant. Well, hello, Felix, and thank you for joining us today. Hello, so, thank, you. thank you for having me. So on the topic of green AI, we are facing a paradox, a duality. While the increasing amount of calcul calculations required for AI is consuming more and more energy, it is also trying to be part of the solution to the environmental issues. What's your view on this? Well, indeed, we know that artificial intelligence is a problem because of the amount of storage calculation it needs to perform. And, um, for example, manufacturing servers or manufacturing the cables that consumes a lot of resources and a lot of energy for the daily use uh, to cool them, especially. Um, and we also know that the amount of data that is stored in the world doubles every year. So it means an exponential growth. Um, so we almost know that the problem it represents for our environment uh, follows more or less the same trend. So this is a problem because algorithms cost a lot of input to run. But on the other side, um, we also know that today uh, artificial intelligence represents part of the solution because artificial intelligence is the source of new ways of working it's a source of innovation and it's a new source for creating businesses. So what businesses will have to do in the future is to juggle between those two aspects. They will be judged on, on their financial results, of course, but they will be judged also outside of this financial aspect. So especially on their commitment to make business with a lower carbon footprint. And I'm sure that AI can help with that. Right. So do you think that companies should actually monitor and report their carbon footprint so they could take action on this? Yeah, yes, of course, I agree. Uh, the first thing you, you need to do uh, if you want to take action is to measure the size of the problem and to identify the problem. So, um, yeah, a company, when their goal is, for example, to reduce their footprint, they need to monitor this and they need to measure if there is improvement or not. Uh, for example, we know that the Orange Group aims to be carbon neutral by 2050. So it is a strong commitment, uh, but to prove that the commitment has been met, uh, you need you need proof. You need to certify that it has been it has been reached eventually. So um, what we need is uh, transparency, and no one is going in the future to tolerate false environmental. Um, tolerate, sorry, false environmental claims uh, in the future, I think. All right. So lately we have also been hearing about frugal AI. Do you have any project in mind that was managed by business and decision that helped reducing the impact of a business without making its footprint worse because of AI? Yes. At business and decision, we implemented methods and governance that are able to meet this need of monitoring the footprint of artificial intelligence. Uh, what I can mention is a project that BND uh, made in France, business and decision made in France. And this project was helping the Orange Group creating an artificial intelligence that allows to reduce the overall electrical consumption of mobile networks uh, in France and outside of France. So 
we know that data traffic increases each year, but in one year we were able to reduce uh, the electrical consumption of the networks by 15% thanks to AI. And uh, we are also able to affirm that this AI doesn't create an additional problem because the algorithm we use and we designed only runs for 15 minutes twice a year. So the consumption of the algorithm is very low compared to the benefits it creates for the business. So there is a, ba a balance to find, actually. Um, you, you cannot implement artificial intelligence to reduce your, your, your energy consumption and um, make your processes more efficient. If, on the other hand, your artificial intelligence consumes too much energy, it, it's counterproductive. So it is our job uh, to implement uh, artificial intelligence that can address real business cases, but that will not damage the overall carbon footprint of our clients. You understand? It's a balance we have to find together. Right, I see. Thank you very much for this example and thank you for your view on this very interesting topic that is green AI. So I get, I suggest we move on to our next topic, which will be the enterprise platforms. All right, so for this next topic, enterprise platform, we stay with our data engineer expert, Felix. Today, we see that the enterprise platform is still linked to very strong challenges within companies, as people still see information as power and thus struggle to share this information even internally. So how can we change the way companies think about data? Which values could we encourage to help them decide to address this problem? Well, as you mentioned, it is a very important topic uh, nowadays for, for companies and businesses. Um, yeah, today we could even talk about a democratized platform company, uh, particularly with the rise of the new technologies such as cloud solutions, development of APIs and the real maturity of solutions such as the open data and data sharing and data marketplaces. Um, all of this is a real accelerator, let's say, uh, for companies uh, and big corporations or even um, public organizations. So um, the way we need to make them understand is by giving examples uh, of the outside world. Uh, for example, if you think about companies like Uber or Airbnb or Facebook, you realize that Uber doesn't own the cars or uh, Airbnb doesn't own the houses or Facebook doesn't create content. Um, but they all have in common to, to be platforms. What they do is they offer a way for users to share their data and create value through this sharing. And this is the main idea of an enterprise platform. Um, the more users you have on a platform and the more data creators and providers you have, the more value you are able to create from these interactions. So it is, the, is, it is also known as the network effect, and it has been described by economists a few decades ago. And um, especially with a, a stress, let's say, or an emphasis on the, on the concept of disintermediation, disintermediation, it's a tongue twister, um, where the relationship between the supplier and the, the, con the consumer or the customer is as direct and as transparent as possible. Uh, and they almost connect directly through through a platform. So, um, yeah, you see it clearly in companies such as Amazon or Alibaba or here in the Netherlands, uh, we have Bol.com Bol, Bol or it's, it's now going live in Belgium. Um, they act as a, let's say, as a platform between customers and, and, and providers. Yes, all right. So it has also evolved technologically. You just mentioned data sharing, data marketplaces, API creations and deployments. These technologies enable value creation for companies, right? Yes, you're right. Uh, we're, we see an explosion in the, in, the, um, in the last years of these new solutions for open data, for data sharing, for data integration and data visualizations, of course. Um, we see of course, that the big high-tech actors are uh, working with these solutions, 
but it's not limited to them. And that that's very encouraging because we see that smaller businesses uh, are also uh, trying to play with them. And um, think about, for example, energy, uh, energy companies or uh, DIY companies, DIY shops or sportswear, for example. And um, there we can observe that there is a real data democratization and uh, we are lucky at business and decision to to witness and support this. Yeah. Um, wh what I can say next is um, companies can either make a business model out of this new way of sharing data, but they don't even need to do so because uh, if they start creating platforms to share data internally between the departments, between the teams, then they will benefit tremendously from it. Um, because in that way, um, internal processes become faster, for example. Um, but they can also choose to, to keep to their original business model and add another layer of service, which is data sharing. And um, the data they have is usually very valuable, so they can be the data provider to other businesses or to competitors and uh, make profit out of uh, making data available for, for their customers. All right, thank you. Well, to conclude, do you have any tips on how to get started on this? Well, uh, any tips? Yeah, always welcome. Huh? I, I would recommend first to start with the use cases you have in your business, of course, uh, the use cases that you are struggling with, that you are, of course, familiar with, that you come across every day or every week. Um, and the, those use cases would be uh, improved by an enterprise platform. And uh, you can build business plans. And um, what is great about this approach and what we have seen among many, many customers is that you don't even have to imagine all the possible cases of upfront because um, creating a platform and letting your internal users, your employees, your your decision makers use it and get a grip on the data. This will encourage creativity and create innovation and new uses that cannot even be imagined today, you know. So um, creating an enterprise platform encourages sharing and collaborating and it also encourages a more I would say a more human vision of things where we share and we innovate together. So I'm very positive about it. All right. Thank you very much for your insights, for your answers. It was very interesting. So this was our last topic for today. Uh, as mentioned, we skipped two other topics, but you can still find them on other sources as mentioned before. Um, so, all right, I would like to conclude here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the presenters and thank you for you who attended this webinar remotely. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, any requests, please feel free to reach out to us directly on our LinkedIn page. We'll always be available and reply promptly. <laughs>